Welcome back, folks, to more Spellcasting 201. Greatness is upon us! Alright. I might have read this in the last game, but let's go through it again. The windowless room is lit only by sputtering torches, illuminating a large rendering of the fraternity seal, painted in dark red, on the basement wall as though in blood. The room is crowded with the already initiated juniors and seniors of HDP, wearing loincloths and covered with lurid war paints. And with your fellow pledgelings in a cobweb corner, you spy a rusty manhole. A narrow wooden staircase beckons toward the world of light. Eric Molten Rock, the fraternity prez, is here wearing face paint, ceremonial robes, and a vacant expression. You see Sid dances with sheep, and Gary Dirty Junk Pile here as well. Check out the seal. The HDP seal depicts appropriately enough a seal, balancing a beer mug on the end of its nose and holding two more mugs on each flipper. Around the perimeter of the seal are several supposedly witty slogans such as I drink, therefore I am, and beer we trust, and muto hune muto birum muto yucky yucks, which translates roughly from ancient Pelorian as more babes, more brewskis, and more bad jokes. Pledge Master Cow Patty descends the stairs, wearing the full ceremonial, almost legendary HDP chicken suit. Pledges! His bellowing is only slightly muffled by his long rubber beak. All of the members of this ancient brotherhood take their commands from our beloved president. But as long as you are pledges, I am your law, I am your life, and I am your god. At this, the assemblance of upperclassmen begin balking and squawking like a henhouse of fire. Punch rubber chicken in the face. Oh, oh, yes, I know I'm aggressive. Cow Patty produces a rubber chicken and holds it out, stiff armed. Lift your eyes, pledges, and gaze if you dare at the farty, the sacred chicken. He raises the rubber bird high enough above his head and then swings it downward again. And again. Flagellating you and the other pledges across the soldiers. Soldiers, shoulders, and back. Alright, so we're getting beat the shit out of by a rubber chicken. This is when I need to call upon Guybrush Threepwood for help. He has experience with rubber chickens with pulleys in the middle of you. Alright, I guess we'll wait around for our initiation to complete. Solemnly, another brother takes the chicken and repeats the beating. As tradition demands, this continues until every brother has swung the chicken or until the chicken has disintegrated. As usual, the chicken hangs in until the end. <clears throat> Can't see much of Mr. Cow Patty inside the absurd chicken suit, just his beady eyes peeking out through the open beak. Listen, all oh, worthless initiates, for well, here are your assignments for the day. You have until 9 p.m. this evening to complete them. Fail a single of your daily task and you'll be turned out of this house, disgraced. Mark, for life is a failure, a pathetic worm left all alone in the morass of the cold, cruel world. The brothers chant, more ass, more ass. I'll do it too. Okay, doesn't work. Um, sit on fire. Oh, I'm dead. <laughs> the fraternity watches as Ernie jumps into the fire and stays there and dies. And they're like, shit, that's not the kind of initiation we were thinking. Dirty chunk pile, you will use this spell to conjure a hornet's nest during today's spellcasting 201 lecture. Dances with sheep, you will set off a smoke bomb on stage during the Blue Demons concert. Your attention roams until Eaglebeak, you will place this mustache on the statue atop the clock tower. 
Cow Patty hands you an absurdly large and bushy mustache. Okay. Trying to take all. One of the HTP upperclassmen sprays you in the face with shaving cream, which is apparently the punishment for daring to touch Farty, the sacred chicken. The torches are essentially welded to the walls. I hope you didn't expect to find a light source that easily. Pledges, now you are the lowest of the low. Not fit to lick dried pond scum off the foot of a horsefly. Succeed today and you will be one step closer to joining the cream of the elite. The best of the best. The farts of the sorcerer. You. The others file up the stairs, squawking and flapping their fucking arms, leaving you alone in the cellar. Sorry, I got a little into it. Let's go ahead and update our save here. So I haven't done uh, any videos in a while. Again, I am moving. It's getting closer to the date. Everything is so far going smoothly. I don't want to talk too much about it because I'm actually going to release a quick video uh, of a nice quick little walkthrough of the home and all the pack shit. I'm not sure why I even bothered to do that, uh, except maybe to show off my 3D printer. But anyways... Uh, next week I will be in Colorado, so there will be zero videos, obviously. The week after that we come back, um, I have to work. I will try to get a couple things uploaded. However, that Thursday we officially close on the house. Um, and then the next day we have to move my entire collection of games, uh, all the furniture. We basically have to clear this entire house out. And move it an hour and a half away, which isn't too bad of a drive at least. Um, but a pain in the ass nonetheless. Um, if you're a homeowner, you understand the trials and tribulations of buying a home. And what a pain in the ass it can be. To, especially if you're selling a home and using that home's equity uh, to put down on the new home. Um, so we are putting down quite a bit. Uh, thankfully, uh, we're making quite a bit off of this house, so that's helping out. Uh, but beyond that, you have to deal with, you know, a million other things. Um, besides the, the, the trillions of papers that you have to sign or e-sign or whatever. It's just a big pain in the ass, so it hasn't left me a whole lot of time outside of work to really sit down and, and do some Let's Plays. Uh, once we get settled in the new house, I will pick things back up. We will start seeing more Bard's Tale, uh, more of the hour-long Let's Plays that I do. Um, and we will, of course, continue Eagle Beak's adventures here. So, anyways, just wanted to give a quick update on the chaos that is my life at the moment and why you have not seen too, so much of me lately. So, from here, uh, I think we can go up into a Hugh Delta Fart Fraternity. Eric Molten Rock, the president is here, doing the same shit he was doing the last time we came in this room. Copies of today's edition of the school newspaper are piled here. Many people are grabbing copies as they pass by. It's amazing how many folks have bird cages that need lining. Yes, yes, and newspapers are also good if you're moving to wrap those beer glasses, folks. So always hang on to some newspaper if you have to move some beer glasses. Um, I had about 50 or 60 that I had to carefully wrap and pack because I did not want to break them. Um, fragility. So let's go ahead and we'll just grab everything here. Take a newspaper. I got my cloak on me, right? Yeah. And I got to remember I dropped a bunch of stuff in What's-His-Face's place, too. Donkey Dung Hall. Well, as we do in all spellcasting games, we need to read the news. 
Prez warns against brutal hazing. President ticking clock overseeing his first fraternity initiation period since assuming the Sioux presidency following Aaron Snowbunny's unexpected resignation in early summer issued a stern warning to fraternity pledge masters to avoid some of the excesses and brutality which have uh, marred some past, mm, past initiation. Uh, yes, say awfully chilly for this time of year, isn't it? Oh yeah, that's most certainly ticking clock talking. Ticking Clock's warning is believed to be in response to an incident during last year's hazing period when a pledge was discovered in the cafeteria drowned in a vat of earthworm stew, wearing a clown nose and a wiggling antenna. The fraternity attributed, attributed the death to a faulty scuba gear. Okay. Disciplinary action is still pending. Man. Drowning in some worm stew, that's some shit. The art section rescheduled Blue Demon concert tonight. The Blue Demons, whose concert was canceled last year after Thug sacked the university, will finally appear at Sorcerer Stadium during an eagerly anticipate, anticipated concert at 6.30 this evening. The mega-hit group was formed two years ago as a septet, but has been a quintet since singer Lucy Ten Longlicks and xylophonist Vance Eat My Shorts left the band to open a theme park outside St. Wienersburg. The departure has not harmed the Blue Demon's tremendous popularity, which soared to new heights with the release of their bodaciously best-selling album, Let's Do It Till Your Mom Explodes. Holy shit. It's raunchy sounding. The concert is co-sponsored by local intercollegiate concert Cabal and the stadium use coordinating Cabal, a spokesman for Lick and Suck, asserted that a small number of tickets are still available. This game was racy for back in the day. Poke a ball, star injured. Bart singing in the rain. 39, the Weasel's star forward Rudderman was treated at the infirmary for a broken leg and several serious contusions following an accident at his fraternity. Singing in the rain is considered to be one of the spark plugs of the team's offense, setting a league record last season for tie-breaking watermelon tosses and leading the team in mushroom formations. His loss is expected to be a severe blow to the chance of bringing a pennant to the Sorcerer Stadium this season. The accident took place in a stairwell at Singing in the Rain's fraternity house. I felt that that I like feeling thighs myself when a piano was dropped under the letterman from a height of two or three steps. According to the injured senior, he and several IPT brothers, that's I felt the thigh, were bringing the piano to the roof of the fraternity house. That sounds like a great fucking plan. Where he planned to jump while his frat mates simultaneously pushed the piano off the roof. I could have been the first person to play the ivories in the free fall, he explained. The rudderman who clutched remnants of the smashed keyboard and sang a body locker room song while his leg cast was being applied arrived at the infirmary dressed only in a necktie and cummerbund. Singing in the rain is believed to have been intoxicated at the time of the accident. No fucking way. A broken tradition, not a broken window. Last week, a junior majoring in theoretical spellcasting received a nasty cut on his finger following the accidental breaking of a window in tutorial room 14. The damage, while not requiring stitches or hospitalization, involved the student's writing hand, and he will... Be unable to take notes for a week or longer. The administration has acted wisely in immediately protecting all glass on campus with the latest generation of anti-shattering spells. In doing so, they ignored a phosphorus Stone Age minority who claimed that such window treatment shattered Sue's architectural tradition. These protesters seem to care about preservation for the sake of preservation and ignore the danger that other students might lose a week of note-taking or worse. It is true that the administration, in its zeal to react quickly to this tragedy, erred by casting and shatterproofing spells too wildly. Leading, for example, to the embarrassing moment during Saturday's dedication of the new student union when President Ticking Clock was unable to break a champagne bottle against the side of a building. However, physical plant personnel assure us that this problem will be corrected by next week. Okay, good to know, good to know. Okay, we are done reading the news. Um, I need to go get my other shit. All right, so. 
Let's go to our room and get all of our shizzle. Should have grabbed that while I was here. All right, we're taking a notebook, our pack of lollipops, our registration form, our spell book, a pellet, a coupon, a sextant, a bed sheet, serving of casserole, larva, ancient key, frock, trophy, and an envelope. Sweet titties. Ivory Tower Lobby, made possible through the generosity and deep pockets of alumnus Peter Ivory Tower. This impressive marble foyer has building exits to the west and south. A plaque has been erected next to the entrance to the large hall to the east. A wide stairway leads up and a small dark stair leads to a lower level. I'm going to save again because we do want to try to also get to our classes. Class time is fun. It's the musty anteroom. The stale air in this small, dim room adds to a general feeling of claustrophobia. A narrow stair winds upward. On the east wall is a heavy wooden door. Above the closed door is a faded sign. Ivory Tower Laboratory. Authorized personnel only. With the ancient key... You unlock the door in a painful screech of unlubricated old iron. Not unlike the screech of a chalk on a blackboard. Only a lot worse. The lock slides open. Ooh, we got us some sound effects. You have entered a vast, gloomy underground laboratory. It seems older than Ivory Tower Hall, which must have been built right on the top of this lab. Slitted windows high up on the walls provide some light. An open wooden door to the west provides some egress. In addition, in a remote and dusty corner of the lab, a metal manhole cover indicates another potential exit. You see the sorcerer's appliance and a lab bench here. On the lab bench, you see the envelope feeder of phlegm, the egg beater of barfton, the ratchet of Weiner Wienersberg, and the nozzle of blather, and the antenna of Puttsburg. Your score has gone up by ten. Gonna examine the sextant here. You realize that this just isn't any old sextant. This is the long lost sextant of Spitul, the President Ticking Clock was talking about. You take them all. Ooh, holding too much. Crap Ola. The egg beater is attached, the envelope's attached, the sextant is attached, a word appears on the side of the appliance that says mineral. I need to drop some crap because I have too much. I don't know if I need all this. Um, what else is... Take all attachments. So now we've attached everything, I believe. Mineral. Uh, 
to examine appliance. The appliance is about the size of a small closet. All of the five great attachments are in place. Also, one of the greater attachments is attached, the section of spittle. Spittle. There are two buttons, one black and one white, on opposite ends of the appliance. As always, its purpose is impossible to divine. Let's push both buttons. Press the white and black button, the appliance clicks. And then it swings slowly, ominously open, revealing a beckoning cavity. The interior of the appliance is about the size of a small closet. The walls look like metal, but are soft and yielding to the touch. One wall contains a power dial and a control panel. The control panel is featureless. All right. Examine dial. It's labeled zero through six. The dial is currently turned to zero. The numbers zero and one are glowing. The other numbers are dark. Turn dial to one. The control panel transforms like clay in the hands of an unseen sculptor. The control panel now consists of a colored dial and a small silver level. Silver lever. Uh, turn colored dial to white spot. Pool lever. As you throw the lever, a voice makes itself heard within your brain. Activation in five minutes. Danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Depart the appliance at once. Let's get out. The appliance opens and smoke billows from the interior. A golden light shines forth and then slowly fades as smoke disappears. Okay, let's go back in. The interior of the appliance is about the size of a small closet. Now there's a diamond here. So what we essentially have here is a gem creation mach machine so we can make rubies, emeralds, diamonds, sapphires, topaz, shit like that. But we need a diamond specifically because uh, the glass anti-glass shatter spell, we can no longer shatter glass with any magic. But... We'll see if glass is protected against the sharp edge of a diamond. Shine bright like a diamond. Okay. Let's get the fuck out of here. Uh, lab flask. Being a total spaz, you'd probably just break it, and it looks pretty expensive and hard to replace. So I guess we didn't take that. But we still have a shitload of other stuff. Let's go to a different save here because I wasted quite a bit of time figuring out all that shibwana wana. And let's get out. A truant's nymph pops into view. Our records show that you're supposed to be in class right now. It's very important to attend all your classes, you know, Blink. And the nymph is nowhere to be seen. Oops. Donkey Dung Hall. A registration nymph appears. Our records show that you're not registered for this course. The nymph escorts you from the lecture hall. Sorry, but class space is at a premium. Man, I gotta find the right class and everything. I gotta be in probably Melting Wolf. I gotta remember where Melting Wolf is. The campus has grown quite large. Uh, Matt bastard.
I'm not registered for Melting Wolf either. Then where the fuck is my class at? Ah. So, pretty damn close to where we were. Occupying most of the first floor of the Ivory Tower Hall is the largest classroom on campus. Spellcasting 201 is in session. Egress is via wide doorways to the west. You see Sid dancing with sheeps and Gary Dirty Junk Pile. Seeing the classes in session, you start taking notes. Auto note taking in this, this, this version. I see a lot of familiar faces out there. In fact, a few faces that are too familiar for my liking. One older student looks, gives a hearty wave. Yes, well, D9, welcome back, and better luck this year. Okay, you've been here 19 years, you stupid fuck. As the class chuckles at well, D9's expense, Walty Toad adds, I always say fit time's a charm. <laughs> As I promised last year, in 201, we'll begin to learn some of the more advanced spellcasting techniques. We'll spend the first four or five weeks of the term discussing... Methods for improving your concentration during casting. You notice Gary Dirty Junk Pile slip into the back of the room, armed with a multitude of spell boxes, which he quickly conceals under his cloak. Tell on Gary. Um, rat out, Gary. Well, then you're stupid. You will learn these techniques and then you will practice them again and practice them again and again and again. You'll practice them until you're worn out, until your spell book begins to fall apart, and until you never want to speak a spell again, and then you'll practice even more. Use of the simulation lab will be absolutely essential to passing this course. The techniques you've been learning and amount of practice time involved means that in class sessions will be wholly inadequate to learn this material. Dirty junk pile... Whispers a simple hornet summoning spell, but he sneezes at the end, and instead a cornet appears, Produce, produces a long brassy wail, and clatters to the floor of the hall. Warty Toad gives a disapproving glance, but continues on. For your first few weeks, we'll continue using your text from the last term. For a handful of transfer students out there, that's Elementary Spellcasting by Julius Body Surfer and Norman Sinking Rowboat. We usually refer to it as BS1. The tower clock chimes the hour. Lots of bong hits are taken. After that, we'll be using BS2. That is intermediate spell casting. Body Surfer and Seeking Rowboat have just updated it, and I'm hoping that we'll be getting the fourth edition hot off the presses in about three weeks. Gary selects a different spell from his repertoire and cast. A nest appears in one of the windows. Not a horn's nest, but a bird's nest. Warty Toad finds the chirping disturbing and slams the windows shut, splattering the birds in all directions. Okay, enough serious stuff. Let's do spell casting. <laughs> Scattered applause. I hate to waste time on reviews, but it's been a long summer, and I can tell by your tans that most of you spent it lying on the beaches in Barton and Blather, and not in your cellar hunched over a spell book. So, let's spend a little time on the frimp spell. Which was the last and most difficult spell we covered last year. This is a level 2 spell requiring significantly more measured cadence, clear enunciation, and sharp concentration. Trying to concentrate, Gary tries the spell again, but nothing seems to happen. Then you glance out the window and notice that a large hornet's nest has appeared on the eve of the building across the courtyard, a good 500 yards away. Warty Toad places a small metal donut on his podium. We'll start out slow. This is the 5 pound donut. Ah, uh, calm before storm, would you care to levitate it? A particularly nerdy sophomore, who naturally was just tapped by Gep, 
utters a technically perfect but uninspired frimp spell. The donut gives the bear's quiver and then rises a couple feet above the stand. The class gives a half-hearted cheer. Clearly, the class is not yet in mid-season form. When any successful spell casting brings a rousing cheer, and a particularly difficult casting can bring a standing ovation. Not too shabby, young man. The professor replaces the donut with a somewhat large one. Okay, let's move on to the 10-pound donut. Pickled chicken liver. You've got a particularly deep tan. Let's see how much of that beach time you spent thinking about spell casting. Your well tanned classmate, a new IPT pledge, Natch, looks worried as he stands and wrinkles his handsome brow. He starts off well, but halfway through he gets confused with the frunk spell, which turns leather to dust. His belt disintegrates, and to the tremendous delight of the class, his pants fall down around his ankles. Needless to say, some remedial practice is in order, Mr. Pickled Chicken Liver. Woody Toad places a large donut on the lectern. You all remember our good friend, the 20 pound donut? A number of students recoil in mock horror. <gasps> the professor scans the class and his eyes fix on your Ah, my prize student, Mr. Eaglebeak. Show us if you still have that magic touch. Frip the donut for us. Well, first of all, we got to save, right? So we can do other shit. A little bit. 40 toad. A few measures of romantic music float through the air. We can't wait all day, Mr. Eaglebeak, but let me say that it'll be a pity if our most talented pupil descends into uncooperative surliness. <laughs> okay, whatever. I'll frimp your fucking donut. As you cast the spell, the weighty donut flies up into the air, strikes the ceiling, and then stabilizes well out of Wardy Toad's reach. A few classmates rise to applaud, but the summer to pour is clearly not yet worn off enough to permit a full standing ovation. I see you haven't lost your touch, young man. Enough review. Time for new stuff. As I said, we'll be spending the first chunk of the term learning new methods for increasing our concentration skills. So for next week, I'd like you to read Bullshit 1, Chapters 33 and 34, as well as Appendix D. Dirty Junk Pile makes another attempt, and Hornet Nest appears on the eve of a still more distant building. One of the most effective methods of boosting your spellcasting concentration is also one of the simplest. Any guesses? A hand? Yes, ah, Mr. Dirty Junk Pile. Your fellow HDP pledge shuffling through spell boxes looks up and replies, Deep breathing? Some titters from class. Now, although that can help, it's not one of the more effective concentrators. The concentrator I'm referring to. Okay, sorry about that. I just had my Tavor beer shipment show up, so I got a little excited. I had to run downstairs, and obviously you have to sign for your beer. Uh, but, yeah. If you haven't checked out Tavor, T-A-V-O-U-R, or Tavor, or whatever the fuck it is, it's an app you can download, and you get access to all kinds of beer that normally you wouldn't have access to. And they ship it to you for 15 bucks. Doesn't matter if it's five or 50 beers, 15 bucks. Anyways, trying hard to modulate the distance factor, Gary casts again and the nest appears inside his cloak. He makes a hasty retreat from the classroom because he's got hornets sticking his, stinging his dick. That's annoying. All right, folks, that wraps it up for this video. I need to get to the gym and then get to work and probably get some shit packed. We'll see you soon with more Spellcasting 201.